Welcome to episode 40 of the Progression Health Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Jacob Kempner. Jacob, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, for anybody that doesn't actually follow, well, doesn't follow me because a lot of people don't follow me. Um, like you said, uh, Jacob Templar, I have uh, my license in physical therapy in the state of New York. Um, I practice New- in Rochester, New York, and I live in the surrounding area. Um, let's see, I got my bachelor's degree at Utica College, and I also got my doctorate there. I graduated in 2016. Um, since that time, I've done a lot of different things. I've done, I have a couple of research projects that I'm working on. Um, I've done a lot of work with the American Physical Therapy Association, uh, where I hold like a position as like a local, it'd be like local governance of that. Um, I'm on the executive board. I've done um, national level stuff. I've um, given talks internationally and nationally about different topics. Um, I worked with the strength guys for three years as an injury consultant. Uh, for high level powerlifting. Um, and then now um, I'm working full time in the clinic and doing some uh, coaching uh, with a different group now. Yeah. So you have like extensive background and level of experience. And what interests me is the level of scientific knowledge you have. And mm-hmm. also uh, you have the experience of lifting as well. You've got like the nice mix of both. Yeah. Yeah. When someone has only one. So when someone has like the credentials without the actual in the trenches experience or when they have only the you know, in the trenches experience and without the credentials, it's kind of like wonder what they're missing, you know, but you have yeah. both, which is great. And I get to see some of that stuff, even with like uh, some of the national stuff I did with P- APTA, like you can see where there's like a difference between what some people think that are maybe just in academia now and are always practicing versus um, people that are kind of either mixed or um, practicing, but not in academia. Yeah. What would be some of the kind of things you'd notice? Like, let's just say, you know, someone's listening, right? And they're like, this person I follow online, you know, puts out really good information. Um, You know, let's, you know, Joel Seidman, for example, right? Puts out good information. (laughs) Uh, Looks really cool. But like, how do I know if it's legit? You know, like they have a PhD, but I don't know if they lift or like they're an IFBB pro bodybuilder or powerlifter or whatever. And like, they don't have a PhD. What, how do you spot someone who's got the quality info a lot of it is just the way that they'll talk about things. Like you, you notice a degree of certainty um whereas i mean that's where i try and be balanced for the most part I'll, uh, and say like you know this is what and, and uh when i write up like things for my posts um microsoft word really hates it the way that i write things because it it keeps it always like auto corrects me and says this is like a passive tone but it's like i'm writing that way because it is the how you would speak scientifically like you're like well i don't have certainty about this, this is what we think this is what we can infer this is you know, things like that uh, versus being like, oh, yeah, it's always this. You have to do this and you can't do this. And typically, the more and more somebody gets like that tends to be much more uh, involved with like academics or um, is trying to be more, I guess, honest, I guess, is the best way to put that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's funny. You say that uh, Microsoft Word gives you that passive feedback because I use uh, Grammarly and Grammarly mm-hmm. tells me the exact same thing. It's like your tone is too passive. I'm like, yeah, but I can't say for certain if like, 10 reps is better than like five reps or the deadlift is better than the squat or whatever, because like just, they're just not, you know, it's like, I'm being honest here. Yeah. Just kind of like you said. So yeah. Uh, if someone is especially certain, then uh, they're probably just kind of like extending the truth a little bit. Yeah. And it, I mean, cause the only things you can be certain of are things that are like tried and true scientific principles. Absolutely. So like regular exercise is good. Uh, none is bad and too much is bad. Um, and like, you know, progressive overload and, you know, there's, there's only a few like fundamental principles that you can actually like, you know, kind of bet on. Whereas yeah. um, if something kind of, yeah, if something seems too good to be true, it usually is. So, but yeah. it, it, it is tricky. I think people who are like kind of charlatans or are extending the truth have got very good at doing that, which is tricky. Yeah. And it's, it's harder when you, um, I don't know, cause like, uh, I've noticed this too. There's like a few people that I've had. Um, I guess debate with their discourse um, where they'll, they'll you know cite a reference or something you'll read the reference and you're like I don't understand how you got what you came away with from from that because uh, I would have interpreted it differently versus like the references I try to use would be ones that either I'm directly talking about it to like say why I disagree with it or you should be able to read that paper and go okay I see where you made those connections and where this information came from. absolutely yeah you can see the line of thought um, would you ever post a bit of research or science and say that like this is an example of something i disagree with and this is where the science is wrong or or the editors or the researchers made a mistake would you ever do something like that yeah i mean i've done that more recently with uh like 
especially passive modalities. Um, and I think I- the progression health podcast has teamed up with TRX. So TRX is a body weight training piece of equipment that you can hook up anywhere, anytime. And, uh, I highly recommend it. I use it in every session with my clients. I use it to warm up uh, and also for stretching. Uh, but if you are traveling, which is where I recommend everyone use it, you know, it's hard to get to a gym. Uh, it's hard to find the time, but you could literally work out from your hotel room with the TRX um, and the door attachment that it has where it doesn't damage the door, but it gives you an effective workout. I also like to add in other things like, uh, glute bands and uh, resistance bands, uh, but once you have the TRX, then you can figure all that out. So get yourself 50% off on the TRX home workout equipment with the code Progression Health TRX and boost your workout effectiveness and consistency. Progression Health podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online therapy service which will help you to more effectively manage your mental health. Mental health is very important and it's something that all of us are realizing now, especially after the pandemic. During the pandemic, for me especially, it was very challenging and I, I reached out to BetterHelp. I uh, tried out a few of their licensed therapists. It's settled on one for the majority of the pandemic and I found uh, the help that I received invaluable. And the great thing also is that you can speak to your therapist outside of sessions. Um, if it's not working out, you can switch. Very affordable. It's really easy to use also. Um, and if someone hasn't tried therapy before, but you're kind of, you know, you're curious, I would highly recommend BetterHelp. So what we've done is uh, we've got a sign up link I'll attach in the show notes and basically you can get a discount to get started and uh, start improving your mental health today. So BetterHelp for better mental health. Talked about that with like craniosacral therapy. Um, Cause could, yeah. could you give some examples of passive modalities just for people who don't know? Yeah. Yep. So that'd be like, um, like kinesio taping or KT tape, um, therapeutic ultrasound, which wouldn't be like imaging to like look at your organs or a baby or something like that. It's meant to generate some kind of heat, um, hot or cold packs, um, 10. So the electrical currents that people think of when they go to like a chiropractor or a physical therapist or something like that. Um, this other one and foam rolling was one that i discussed too don't take foam rolling from me yet i value it too much every time well that's the uh that's what the science shows is that if you believe that it works it will work so if it's worth your time investment the using it i guess yeah yeah um yeah the placebo effect is strong but it's funny you mentioned that the hot pack so i have a, a run coming up on saturday i'm going to do a half marathon and i was like I'm feeling a little bit of muscle soreness. Uh, what can I do? I'm trying to like, you know, sort of optimize recovery, but I know that it's like a bit of a fallacy or, you know, you, you can't really optimize it other than just sleep well and program well. But uh, I have, um, it's funny, I'm looking at my calendar and I'm like hot tub Friday night, the night before <laughs> the, uh, the run, because I'm going to hope that the heat will improve recovery. Do you know anything about, you know, sauna, hot tub? I hot water immersion, I guess it would be for yeah. recovery. There seems, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, how much does it help? Like it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't seem to have like an effect, especially for like muscle soreness where there's been some papers, I think on like uh, muscle growth and things like that. They've shown it has an effect. It's just like the degree of the effect, um, you know, it might not be worth somebody to invest like, you know, 30 minutes in doing that, if it's going to take away from like them actually, you know, like sleeping more or eating enough or drinking enough fluid that's not alcohol, like stuff like that. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a gray area, right? It's like, there's yeah. no, yeah. There's not even a protocol for hot water immersion, is there? Um, I'm not that I'm aware of. I've, I've read some stuff on like delayed onset muscle soreness. So like the soreness you'd get after exercise. Um, but yeah, there's not really like, I think the stuff for like muscle growth is like, it has to be within, it's almost like there, there is an anabolic window of that. It has to be within a certain time period after exercise for it to actually ha seemingly to have an effect. Yeah, I actually heard the opposite then for, well, I think it's cold water immersion. I think Brad Schoenfeld said that um, cold water blunts uh, muscle protein synthesis. So basically, I'm not sure does it does the same apply for you know, the heat, but yeah, there's just no protocol for some of these like external modalities or passive modalities. So like even phone rolling, for example, like if you had a, a client, would you recommend phone rolling? Is there a protocol for phone rolling? I mean, I'm sure there's some in research that I could find, but I typically would, you know, most of the time focus on other areas first, unless that's like going to be the easiest thing to change or um, you know, it just has no, not like a lot of investment in the time or something like that. Yeah. Which is funny you say that because it's like, 
you know, I'm in the gym every day. I'm like, I, I swear, I see somebody every day doing foam rolling. And I'm like, do you not realize like you have limited time and like your time could be allocated more effectively to like so many other things? Like, what are your thoughts on sort of just like the, just the effectiveness, allocation of time and, and these passive modalities? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like, you're usually at least having to invest like 10 to 30 minutes at a time with them. And it's like, well, that's potentially 30 minutes, you know, 10 to 30 minutes, you could have been doing something else that may have more of an effect either on recovery or like the goals that you're trying to get towards. I mean, cause 10 minutes of exercise just by itself, if you don't exercise at all um, is a significant amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. I saw another podcaster, Simon Hill, he's got a, a great podcast and he was talking about, you know, he was talking about doing like three bouts of like 10 or 20 minutes of like high intensity exercise a week and that is all you need for cardiovascular like heart benefits. Yeah. And and people would spend that time foam rolling. Like yeah. so and foam rolling, we don't even know the benefits. Yeah. And like I would have um I've had patients do this, like just be like, yeah, start with like a 10 minute walk. Like if you're not doing anything that's gonna have a substantial effect um on like your blood pressure, probably even on sleep regulation, um, like can affect your hunger, can affect um, you know, um uh, your heart and lung health just in general besides your blood pressure yeah uh, like walking yeah so if I actually be exercise but also i can find it sort of like therapeutic and relaxing as well so there's like yeah a lot there's a lot more research on walking i would say as well because it's been around yeah um, so then just thinking of would you count like so thinking of passive uh, mm-hmm. modalities would, would you count stretching as a passive modality and then what is like what's your opinion on stretching When's it most effective? When is it ineffective? What are your thoughts around yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it can be, it is an active thing, but it's, it's depending on what your goal is, right? If you want to, or need to regain range of motion, then that may be sometimes our, our, our best like approach um, to like have somebody do that, but it's building a tolerance into a position. But like at the same time, depending on what, if you're a lifter and you can't get in a position um, and it's, you know, if you're a novice to it, well, if you just keep doing that activity, eventually you'll be able to get into that position anyways, because it's just more exposure and building tolerance to those different positions versus like somebody's much more experienced and having trouble with that. I might then give them, okay, let's do this kind of stretching quote unquote. Um, so that it makes it easier, um, to achieve what we're looking for right away. Got it. Yeah. So let's give, I'll give you like a, an example. I come across very common, uh commonly on the, the gym floor so i'll have a new client they're like detrained so they haven't trained in, in years yeah or they're new to like barbell training which is typically where um where we'll go if we have no kind of contraindications or reason not to so then basically in my head i'm kind of you know there's two sides to it it's like this person is trying to hit depth in the squat for example and it's like so they're just uh detrained they haven't trained in a while so it's either that is the reason they can't hit depth or they don't have the mobility. But basically, the way I see it is, you know, we've limited time, we've roughly an hour. Stretching is just not exercise. It's not going to uh, have as many benefits as getting under the bar or mm-hmm. doing a different modification. So I'm kind of like, we just keep getting the reps in and eventually your your body will adapt and you will become stronger and be able to hit depth. That would be yeah. kind of my approach, just because there's so many other benefits to movement that you don't get with stretching. So um, I guess, yeah, like, what do you think of that? Like, instead of, you know, doing the stretch and you go and you get extra reps in off, off the squat. Yeah, I mean, that's that would typically be my approach because a lot of it could be even, I mean, some of the reasons why a novice won't hit depth can be related to just motor learning. So like the way that our body learns to move and help us to navigate like different activities. Like, so if you're not used to it, the muscles on both sides of your joint are going to be um, turning quote unquote, turning on and off at different um, speeds. Um, just making sure that I speak to more like a lay person terminology um, where, you know, those muscles be contracting on both sides. Well, if you have, you know, a pulley that's pulling on one end and also pulling on other things don't really move that well. So that can make it challenging to hit a certain position or a depth of a movement or whatever. Um, and then once you learn how to do that, you don't, you know, it's like watching on those documentaries when like a baby deer tries to walk at first. It's like, we're all like that when we start something new that we haven't done before. Yeah. We just kind of haven't had uh, the time to uh, 
sort of like master the task or learn the skill yeah so even for example like I've been training for like 10 years or so and I used to think like oh you have a bad squat I used to describe my squat as like a folding chair motion like Mm -hmm. my back would just fold over and now I'm like I don't have a bad squat at all it's just that I'm not uh trained or fit enough to hit an upright squat and if I just keep at it I will I'll just progressively I'll, I'll progressively overload my body I'll progressively get stronger. My technique will improve also as I get stronger. It, there's nothing. I'm not broken, dysfunctional. Uh, I don't have imbalances. I'm I'm actually just physically sort of like unfit or weak. That's like my my thinking on it. Um, so from that, how how often do you think a client is actually like dysfunctional or has an imbalance or like is kind of uh, incapable of doing a movement versus? you know, just not having the fitness for it. Yeah. I mean, more often than not, it's probably related to them just not yet having the capacity for something or not been exposed to something. Cause even, even like clinically, when I'm working with patients in the office, like there's not a lot of times where I'm like, well, that person just cannot do that movement unless they have like, um, you know, for an example, like, like turning your head or neck or twisting in a certain way, if you've had like back fused, well then there's a good reason for that, like why you can't move in certain directions or um, it's been a while, but I haven't worked with many ampu- people who had amputations. Um, that might be something why, like when they do something, it looks different or um, you know, the way that their, their body is shaped even too. Like, and so you may do something, it may not look like how we think it should look, but if it fits, because there's lots of different ways that we're shaped and sized and things like that, it's going to look different. Yeah, yeah, we're all individuals. What, yeah. what are your thoughts around like some of the kind of diagrams going around online of like this person's femur inserts into their hip in this way and that means they're not built to squat or like, you know, those those kind of like points that are made. Do you think yeah. uh, some people are just not built to squat and they should avoid it or like is everyone capable of it? They just need to figure out their individual movement pattern? Yeah, I think that's like more of the case. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Like why we would never be able to do something like it's just going to maybe look different for you or you may have an experience that then allows like for a different movement to be just more um, beneficial for you, I guess, or like you may feel more comfortable do it, doing it. You may like it more. And so like, you can get away with that. Like there's no reason why everybody has to barbell squat or deadlift like you can do other things it's just the way that my approach is like I just look at what maybe gives us for the space or the equipment or whatever maybe the most uh, benefit for the time that we're spending on it yeah yeah so you kind of make it work based on the resources you have available to you so yeah how often is it the case that like someone avoids like barbell training so I, I say barbell training because mm. uh, you can tell me what you think of this as well is because I would say barbell training is what everybody should aim for if they can, because it's the most mm. effective way to, to, to do resistance training. So that's one point. But how often do you think it is that people just don't allow themselves to do barbell training because they tell themselves they can't and they might actually be capable of it, but they just, they just say, oh, I hurt my back deadlifting or squatting or bench pressing or they have a yeah, limiting I th- belief. I think so. If it's a limiting belief, I think that's pretty common, like in general, um, cause it's already such a niche of like people that are probably active already. Like if you consider that maybe 5% of people in industrialized countries are actually like, at, like sufficiently active to maintain and see like co- continual health benefits. But then you got to think out of that percentage, like what amount of those people actually like enjoy barbell training, um, and do it because they like it rather than like, they do it because it's going to help them achieve another end goal, like to play a sport or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so few people that actually do it that it's, yeah, it's, it, there's a huge resistance to it. Um, what do you think uh, in, the, in the clients you've seen, what do you think are the reasons that people stick with barbell training um, long, long t- term? Yeah. It's, I mean, I think it's typically because they enjoy it or like um, bodybuilders. I see like where they maybe find it beneficial or they like to do it. In, in some way or like it's part of their off-season training or something like that or in bodybuilders it's interesting because i in powerlifting like where I'm more gravitated towards it's it's a such a mainstay and like because I have a home gym it's just the versatility is just insane because I have very minimal equipment but I can do just about anything that I need to um there's like a bodybuilder goes into a gym like I have friends that are professional bodybuilders and they don't squat or deadlift they um 
definitely use a lot more machines and things like that. So it's like, just depends on that, you know, or maybe the time of year you're in or, you know, what your goals are at the time. So some people, you know, and people may look at that as like a recovery thing too, is where like, if you're playing a different sport, maybe easier because of constraints of machines um, where you're only doing like specific movement patterns or it, like, you don't have to like learn the movement as much. It's maybe more helpful for, for your recovery in a way. Yeah. Like there's uh, the machines, there's the barbells, there's all different ways to work out. So I feel like there's something for everyone if they just give it a chance. Like, yeah, so you're speaking a little bit about clients you work with. So like, you know, what is your specialty and, and like what type of clients do you kind of specialize in working with? Yeah. So in like normally for me, it's, it's anybody that has like lower back, neck pain, upper back pain, just anywhere along the spine um, and then headaches. I mean, that's primarily what I would see, but I, I'm for well versed enough to treat just about anything at a fairly high level. Um, like sh- people who have issues with their shoulder or their knee or their head, um, just, you know, you see enough people, <laughs> but like, that's my main thing is like anybody who has like back or, or spine related issues. And, and for, for lower back pain specifically, I feel mm-hmm. like it occurs much more frequently. Is that, is that the case with injuries? And, and if so, why is it the lower back that is more commonly injured? It, it's an, a, a namber. Um, like we don't understand scientifically why that's the case quite yet, other than that it, there's multiple factors that go into contributing to lower back pain. Like a lot of things like, you know, genetics, environmental factors, even like your socioeconomic status, maybe where you live, the type of work you do, um, maybe your fitness level um, and just a regular exposure to things that we would assume to be risk factors for developing it. But it's fairly common across like, just humans in general that 80 to 90% of people eventually at some point in their life have some back pain for at least like a day or two. Wow. So it's really like 80 to 90% of adults are going to have back pain, lower back pain at some point. Yeah. It's even higher than we used to think in adolescence too, but it's like, just because it hurts doesn't mean that's necessarily like disabling and like preventing people from doing things. So um, there's a difference between like the amount of people that might have some pain once in a while versus like the people that are like disabled. Because- Got it. Yeah. So the severity is different. And then um, can you differentiate between pain and then injury? Yeah. That's an interesting one. Cause because of how like complicated pain is like, there is a distinction because like really pain is supposed to be um, more of like a, uh, it's like a command. So it's meant to tell you like, Hey, this is potentially threatening or could harm you, you know, don't do that. Um, you know, so if it wasn't for pain, we probably would have more injuries than we, we do. Right. Cause it's meant to be there before you, you actually hurt yourself. Like, otherwise it would be a bad alarm. Like you don't want your smoke detector going off, like after your house burned down. Absolutely. Yeah. It would just be totally ineffective. And something else that I've heard about pain is that, and maybe this is just applies to low back pain specifically, but mm-hmm. uh, most pain is nonspecific and mm-hmm. then most pain goes away of its own, you know, doing. So like, yeah. W- what are your thoughts around like, is most pain like nonspecific or does it typically target a certain area? And then does it just resolve itself over yeah. time? Yeah. So I wanted to, so I want to touch on one thing before about like the pain injury. Um, and we say that too, is like pain and injury is different because also we tend to see is that um, there can be people that it's like 25% of people in uh, industrialized nations. Cause this, I'm just saying this is where we get the data from um, have pain longer than it took for like an injury to heal. So they have it, something, maybe they did injure themselves it's healed and now they still have. Um, and then typically when we talk about like non-specific pain, um, cause this goes for like the shoulder, someone's shoulder, their lower back, their neck, their knee, um, more and more we're finding that these symptoms, we call them nonspecific in, um, like as a research term to, to say that because, um, like I wouldn't tell somebody that in person just because it tends to be non, not very empathetic. Um, but the terminology is meant to say like, well, we cannot reliably like say, this is the specific source of the symptoms, or this is like, you know, it's this muscle or it's this specific structure um, because we know like, because of how complicated pain is and how the sensors kind of work in different areas that it's too vague to, and unreliable to do a bunch of tests or even scans and be able to tell you like, yep, that's the exact reason why you hurt other than 
you know, if somebody has like cancer or fracture or some other like infection or something like that. Yeah. So most of the time it's better off not to kind of like look into it or read into it too much. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. Because the thing is, is like you could hyper focus on stuff and you're like kind of getting lost in the weeds rather than focusing on the bigger picture. So like you could be like, oh, I really need to figure out exactly what's wrong with it, but that you may not need that to feel better and get better. Um, Because for most of the nonspecific pains that we are labeled in research, um, most um, stuff shows that if you exercise, you'll get better. Um, Given time, it's going to get better. Um, And and there's a lot of different reasons why that can can be the case. Yeah, yeah, it's really layered, multifactorial. There's a lot going on. So just for example, if you were to finish this podcast, touch wood now, right? But you're to get up and you're to feel like lower back pain or knee pain or shoulder pain. Uh, what would be like some kind of questions you'd ask yourself or thoughts you would have so that like you could best manage? Yeah. So this actually happened to me recently. Like I, I have chronic like back pain, I would say. Um, and I had this earlier this year, I had some knee issues. And like my wife was saying to me, because I was like, kind of hobbling just to get up and down the stairs she's like should you go see somebody i'm like who sh- who am i going to go see what are they going to tell me that i don't know um but i would typically think of like okay how much am i sleeping like even do you know, do you know what's funny C- can you think of a client saying that to somebody else as well yeah you, could you think of a client like literally saying that not, saying, very, not very often so if a client uh is injured i feel like that would be a typical layperson response what are they going to tell me i don't already like you know that yeah, kind of that could be but like, I was thinking like with my knee, like I'm like, so like if I get an MRI on my knee, the chances are it shows that I have a meniscus tear is, is really high, even if, if I didn't have knee pain or something like that. But like, yeah, there's a lot of men in particular that would do that. Like, what are they going to tell me? My back hurts. I already, yeah. I already have the pain. What more is there to know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there, and that's a good mentality even to have, like there's a, there's a, I forget the statistic, but there is a, per, a huge percentage of people say that never get to physical therapy for example, that have some of these issues and they continue to live their life. They never experience like they may have some degree of suffering, but not enough to where they're like, I need to assume this role of like being a patient or saying like, I am sick, um, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I heard something. I'm not sure was it your own post or someone else's, but it was like farmers who have a very uh, laborious job have like pretty severe injuries and they just keep on working. No problem. Like just, you know, with with the pain or with the injury so yeah like just kind of getting back to like how how would you manage pain Mm -hmm. so if if somebody like a farmer can work like six days a week every week of the year for example with pain uh hypothetically and some people might get a little tweak and they just stop exercising for a month like what's the sort of what's a a useful approach or questions to ask yourself yeah so i mean i i think to myself like when i do that like what's my sleep been like lately how stressful has like life been and that doesn't have to be even negative stress it could be positive stress like if you're just doing a lot of different projects you have a lot of things going on like family wise like whatever like so you're just thinking about how much resources are your body using at that time um you know if i sleep or ate eaten enough or like drank enough am i hydrated enough like things like that like very simple things and then you know i would explore movement a little bit and be like okay what can I do and still do that like when my knee was hurting I still squat like almost the same weights I just changed the um things a little bit like I just squat to my bench instead of like to full depth and then um just kept doing that stuff like so even though I could barely go up and down the stairs I was like well it doesn't prevent me from like doing everything else that I want to do. So I'm just going to keep doing things. Yeah. So you, you modify your approach. That's a really creative way to do it as well. Cause you don't get that full uh, bend at the knee with the, with the bench. So, yeah. uh, well, and the thing is that like, I would say even like an average physical therapist, like at least this is just my experience. I like me thinking about not like people that I interact with online, but like people that I work with or have worked with, I would say like on average, they, and even like average health professionals don't know, to the degree about pain that I have like looked more into, like I've read several textbooks and I continue to read like new research. So it's like just my understanding of pain. I'm like, well, it's, it's like a physicist. Like they just know how things in the world work. So they go, well, I'm not going to worry about that because I know X, Y, and Z. Like they have just this understanding of, of what it is in the process. So it causes you not to freak out. Like, you know, if I was a mechanic and something on my car broke, probably not going to be as big a deal um, as if it was like for someone like me who knows 
very little about how the car works. Yeah, very good example. Um, so then for people listening, or even just myself, who's as uh, skilled as yourself, what are some ways that we could manage pain more effectively? Like, um, I'll just give an example myself. So, mm-hmm. you know, I said I have the run coming up on Saturday. I was meant to go for a two mile fast run before this. And I just said, feeling a bit of like uh, muscle soreness, calves are a bit tight and stuff. I don't need to do this run. Um, and I have a workout coming up later on anyway. So I kind of just said, I push it back to later in the week and maybe I won't do it because, you know, I'm trying to, uh, kind of deload almost this week. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like, how do you know when to like keep moving or like, you know, what are just kind of useful questions for us to ask with less experience compared to yourself? Yeah, it's usually like, like I would do this with people that don't have necessarily like maybe like, I don't know, I guess how to explain this. Some people get really like they need like a number to go off of like for pain. And then I have some people that are like, well, they can just they t- like I had one uh, girl I worked with. She's a teenager. She played uh, okay with soccer. And like I would ask her, well, when would it when it, does it get severe enough for that? Like feel like you can't do different activities. And she would tell me like an 11 out of 10 pain. So I would like, OK, our cutoff is like a 10 or an 8 out of 10. So that way it would allow her to still like engage with activities and do stuff. But like within what she considered to be a tolerable range of pain. So like, if you feel like something's tolerable, like keep doing it and and stay active and then kind of monitor what you feel like afterwards, you know, like does it subside again within 10, 15 minutes back to like wherever you were before? Like that's just a general good rule of thumb just to be like, you know, allow yourself to experience and and move and still do stuff and reinforce to your body. Like there is safety and movement rather than like avoiding things. Um, Cause that's part of like how we develop chronic pain is like fear of movement. And it may not even be like a conscious fear that we have, but like by having certain behaviors reinforced to your body, like it's not safe to potentially do this activity. Um, so engaging with stuff again and just realizing like, Oh, my opportunities to move and do things are actually much wider than I than I think they are right now um goes a long way in you feeling better like quicker get back to normal daily functioning then yeah so know that or you can tell maybe you know the exact statistics but I feel like the activity levels or I should even the activity levels are very low I think it's mm-hmm. only like 25 percent of adults meet the recommended like the world health organization's recommended yeah and that's being fairly generous because it's based on, uh, those are based on surveys. People over-report, yeah. So, okay, let's say it's, let's just say it's 20% of what we generate. Yeah. So 20% of adults um, do enough exercise. Um, would you say that the majority of people don't have enough experience with exercise to know when to push themselves and when to pull back or when to modify it? I think so. Or they don't just maybe even feel confident enough. You know what I mean? Like um, they, they just don't have as much understanding as like I would and be like, oh, that'd be simple. Like I would just do this instead. Um, you know, whereas I'm like used to that being like, oh yeah, if my knee hurts and I can't squat all the way to depth, like I'm just not going to go that far down instead of just avoiding it completely. I'll just change something a little bit or, you know, use less weight. Um, and I see this with patients too. Like I've had some where they're like, Oh, I'm only going to lift light weights and like higher reps because um, I think heavier weights going to hurt me again versus like, I'm like, well, you could probably progress back into that and it would be fine if you want to do, but if you want to keep doing that, that's fine, I guess. Yeah, you could, um, you could probably do a lot more than you think if you just modified your approach. Yeah. So yeah. Um, if you ever come across people who like don't enjoy exercise because we're kind of promoting exercise here indirectly mm-hmm. and we're just talking about it because we, you know, exercise regularly, but it's like, do you come across people who just don't enjoy exercise? And like, what would you say to those people? If you had a client, for example, come in and they're like, I've chronic pain and they just, they're like, not going to move and I don't enjoy it. Yeah. So then with those people, I almost make it less about like structured exercise because like it's all dependent on like, I guess, like where's the limiting factor, right? So like for me, the limiting factor for doing like yard work might be my like cardiovascular endurance versus power lifter. Yeah. Versus (laughs) like my strength, like you know, I I can move furniture and like do all that kind of stuff and whatever, no problem. Um, It's like if I have to do something for like a really long period and like the whole day, like that might be more limiting for me. Um, So then with the person who doesn't like that stuff, then I go, okay, well, what what stuff is it that like you want to get back to? Like, do they like to cook? Do they like to maybe clean or do crafts or whatever? And then make that like a part of their therapy. So instead of doing like, oh, you got to do these like specific exercises, well, let's you know, what are you doing around your house already? And let's um, portion that out into, you know, sometimes paced act and graded activity. Yeah, because would you agree with this, that it's like, whether you want to or not, you're going to have to do some sort of exercise in your daily living anyway. Yeah. And it's just, how do we make that to where now it's like 
beneficial and like giving them some kind of organization to the chaos that we live in so that they can um, kind of understand and, and modify and, and be more independent eventually of me into making some of those changes. Yeah, like not everyone needs to run like 10K or lift, you know, like 300 pounds or whatever, but do need to have some base level of ability, like the kitchen work you're talking about or yard work or something. So yeah. that's where... I saw a woman late recently. Um, she had, she slipped on ice is what she told me. She slipped on ice and broke her, her ankle, like one of the bones in her ankle. And then I remember she initially didn't come for anything because it was fairly, it should have been straightforward, like in a cast, like it healed. Then she wouldn't have needed PT. She could have just gone back to her normal activities, but it wasn't healing correctly, even though they tried other stuff. So they, they did an internal fixation surgery with her. And she was very distraught the first day I saw her because this woman's life um, is a lot based on, especially in the city, like I live in more of the country just outside of the city. Um, people there in particular, like I'm just not used to this because I grew up in rural. It, it's like if I can't walk there a lot of times or take the bus to get there, then it's like I'm not going to go and do that stuff. So for her, like it was very valuable to just be able to like get up, go walk to visit her friends or go to the store or whatever. I mean, most of what I gave her was just like paste and graded walking and like, hey, do this. Um, and she got a lot better and we, I think it was Thursday or Friday of last week, um, is when her last visit was nice. So it's that, like that graded exposure to exercise after, uh, an injury is how you return. Yeah. And, and that's the thing with even like, um, I've had people come in and they're like, yeah, I, I, uh, I have the hardest time like doing laundry. I go, okay, well, like how long does it take you to do your laundry? Like, are you doing it? And sometimes we've just had them like space that out. So instead of doing like all their laundry during, you know, one day of the week, like do some loads through the whole week and you're having to do that activity. And then eventually they're like, oh, well now instead of doing like half a load, I do a full load. And now I do, you know, can do two loads a day or whatever. And then now they're just doing all their laundry at once. They, they went from doing that on the one day to do not multiple days or vice versa. Yeah. So instead of doing, maybe like you have to do like three or four loads a day and that's a lot for them to pick it up, carry it down their stairs, go to the washing machine. Um, then I'd have them do, okay, well like take half a load down and do that and do that like multiple days per week. And then eventually like, you know, just throw an extra towel in or, you know, an extra shirt or two or something like that. And then eventually they're like, Oh, I'm doing all my laundry all at once. I might have to steal that one because uh, you're, you're telling me that going down with the full load in one go, it's, we have stairs as well. Yeah, it's, it's actually like doing a workout. But um, just with uh, kind of touching on like spreading out the total work you do, doing it over like a week, especially with chores. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's a way to like adapt to like an active lifestyle by doing more activity on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So do you have any kind of like quick and easy tips for people to like, incorporate exercise into their daily life or just in their weekly life to have a more active lifestyle yeah i mean i mean some of it can be like for just a person maybe doesn't exercise it can be as little as like park my car further away from like the store um you know you purposely instead of taking an elevator you take stairs um other things i, I heard greg knuckles talk about this too and this is something that's actually been like research they've looked at this in like office workers where they have them do like exercise snacks. So it's like getting up and walking around or like um, walking on the stairs for a few minutes, like five minutes, I think is all they needed. And they saw like a significant benefit, but it's like you can go from a lot of people go from college and then you see they go to like an office job or now working at home. And then you like completely like stop moving as much. Like I remember in college, like it probably, I wish I had a Fitbit or something back then. Cause I bet I probably walked like as much or more than I do per day now. Um, cause that's, I just, I didn't really use my car. I just walked everywhere on campus. Um, whereas like having them do stuff like that. So like, oh, um, you know what, I'm going to get up and like walk around for a couple of minutes. Cause like, that's another thing too, is like, it's still a thing. Like people still smoke and like those smokers get like 15 minute breaks, I think every once in a while. So it's like, technically you could just get up, walk around be like, oh yeah, I'm going to use whatever excuse. Like if you have to use like a smaller water bottle, I'm going to get water. Or uh, if you drink a lot of water, then you have to go to the bathroom more. <laughs> like things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Just I feel like it's engineering exercise back into your daily life because like with technology, it's just been like, it's been strategically like engineered out. You know, we save time, but we lose our health, I feel like. Yeah. And I've thought about that too. Even like, I like 
my wife and I both will watch like historical shows together. And I'm like thinking, you know, if I wanted butter, like, you know, my grandparents, my grandparents were born in like the late 1800s. Um, so much different time than now. And like, it was like, if they wanted butter, they actually had to like churn it to get butter. Like I can just go on my phone and like go on an app and say, go like, oh, I want this at the store and somebody will bring it to my house. Yeah, we have to do so little work uh, when we compare it with uh, generations past. I feel like that gives us more time to exercise in a way though, you know? Like, yeah. um, I like, so I used, to, I used to cycle around the city for, for transport and, uh, you know, I use an electric scooter now. And I'm like, so I'm actually just, I'm like, oh, I, I'm losing out on the exercise. You know, there's like obviously huge exercise benefit to cycling. But I like to think of it as uh, now I can actually choose how I exercise as opposed to having to exercise for transport. So mm-hmm. um, do you think we st- do you think people have enough time to exercise? I think you can. It, it just depends on what your priorities are, right? Like, and some people might not be in a life uh, situation where it, it seems as feasible or approachable um, to make it part of their the regular um, daily life yeah when you see someone like you know uh like a single mother with with, with like two mm-hmm. or three kids or just like you know like uh someone who like has their own business and they're like they're just anyone who's got very limited time how do you uh help those people who are particularly challenged with time to increase their activity yeah um, if, if they're not like, exercising enough that may be like either like have re- having them like restructure or, like schedule it in or something like that or like for like somebody who has kids, it's like that sometimes is easier um, because you can be like, well, what what are things that your kids like to do? Like, can you play with your kids and you could be active in those ways? Um, or maybe their kids like some kind of activity and now they're doing that more with, with them um, to get them a little bit more active too. Or if it's like, you know, I just don't have the time. Um, it may be like, okay, well, where, where in your day could you like feasibly get like five minutes? So then they can have a short um because short doesn't mean bad like you can get um high intensity work for um several minutes and and that sometimes has the health benefits we're we're looking for yeah, absolutely we can keep it like short and sweet and just be really effective with uh how we we exercise yeah if we have limited time um so just going to some of your your posts on social media they're like mm-hmm. very interesting and, and informative and i recommend anyone to check out um jacob's content what's your instagram handle again uh strength in evidence underscore physio yeah the operative word being evidence there is so much science in your posts it's like very very impressive um but one of uh one of your posts is uh if it hurts just don't do that i feel like that's a lot of people's kind of like common approach to to different like movements so for example the most common one is probably deadlift they hurt themselves mm-hmm. and it's like it hurts my lower back hurts so i'm not going to deadlift um and basically the questions that i had from that were you talked about blaming stigmatization um mm-hmm. and 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 frustration as it relates to, to pain um so can you just talk a little bit about those uh those terms that idea yeah so the idea with that is like somebody might get hurt while doing something and you get you can get like multiple types of like stigmatization. So it's either like people blame you for being injured or like, be like, well, why were you doing that? Or like, um, I've even seen that where like you go into like, I don't know, like an emergency room or your doctor's office and they're like, I just don't understand like why you would be like, if you're a power lifter, like deadlifting the amount of weights that we would lift. And they're like, I don't, I just don't understand like why we would enjoy doing that and be like, well, why do you enjoy doing whatever it is you like to do? Um, so there's that. And then like, just by like telling somebody like if it hurt don't do that it's just not helpful like there's no actionable solution to that and it's like well do they want to be able to do that again like um you know and and sometimes like that's a way to increase their fear associated with something so like i've gotten more into like recently this theory these theories that relate to like chronic pain and like development of pain where it discusses like fear versus safety related movement and it, it, there is you know, a decent theory out there that like they discuss, you know, your body is weighing all this information that's coming in constantly, right? And you aren't aware of it all the time. Like that's why we only use a, a fragment of our brain to like consciously interact with the world. Cause like we use 10% of it like actively, like I am aware of what's happening versus like the other 90% is doing all this stuff. Like, you no, know, that physics stuff, we don't have to think about. It's understanding like what I'm seeing, like 
it's connecting all these different parts. It's organizing things in my body. Just so much is going on um, and it's filtering this information. So based on that stuff, it goes, well, is this safe for you? Is there potentially threatening? So I'm going to make, you know, oh, well, I think it's going to be, could be harmful. So you should have pain with this. But if we consistently tell people like you shouldn't do that, if it hurts, then you continue to reinforce this pattern then with that, whatever that information is that comes in with that movement um, and there's their own conscious bias or association with an activity where now they're going to say, well, I'm not going to do that because this health professional said that was bad. I shouldn't do that. I need to move this very particular way. And by doing that, we're reducing the opportunities. Then you have to engage and interact with different things, which then creates this it's this ongoing cycle now because like if if every time something hurts we just tell somebody not to do it well eventually they're not going to be able to do anything and you paint yourself as a practitioner into a corner where your options of like things you can have that person do are very limited now by limiting ourselves that's the thing about humans is like we need that you know it's like kids we wouldn't just you don't just put a kid in a box and just go, okay, you're going to grow up. Absolutely not. No, the, the uh, first example that come to mind with, uh, if it hurts, just don't do that. It's like, you know, like, a, you know, dating, for example, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, it, it's too painful to date. And then like, could you imagine like, you're, you know, someone just saying, oh yeah, just don't get into a relationship at all. Or, yeah. you know, getting out of bed in the morning. It's like, <laughs> you're like your doctor. Yeah. It just kind of, it, it's tough getting out of bed in the morning. The doctor's like, yeah, just, just don't do it. Don't get out of bed. And it's like, no, that's not how you, you know, grow and develop as a person. Um, yeah, ex- exactly. And that, that creates issues where now we're getting in the way of those things where things get better on their own. Typically, like we're creating a barrier to it getting better on its own. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there's kind of a point that we're not talking about it in that like benefit of exercise, like, mm-hmm. and just movement and like almost like more exercise is better. Yeah. Do you have any would you agree with that? I mean, typically, like the, the way you think about it is right. There's multiple things. Like, so people talk about as I get older, they feel like they get injured more. But a lot of that's because you just have more exposure and opportunities to have gotten injured. So you're like, well, I just remember more like these times versus like when you're a kid and you just do something and not think of it or not remember it. And so that also helps, uh, can help people develop like the different contexts or like um, frames of references of like resiliency where you could potentially think, at more like well when have I done something that would be fairly challenging or difficult like how often do I physically challenge myself like um if I'm deadlifting you know say like today I, I'm supposed to work up to 515 like you know if I do that like why would lifting a 20 pound box like why would I think that that's hard if I can physically do the other you know what I mean like so your body has another context to be like oh well like we've done this thing that's way more challenging than this this should not be threatening at all like at, even at a subconscious level yeah yeah the, the challenge makes us better uh, so i want to talk about the kevin deba kevin ba debate also the language you use so mm-hmm. you're, you said uh you're supposed to work up to 515 so does that mean that you're unsure if you can do it or that you're going to see how you feel and you'll, you'll go by how you feel yeah i'll see how i feel like because it depends on my recovery on a day like i might not be able to actually get to it that's the target is to do that for three sets of at least two and then an amrap at that, that actually the last set a third set so it's th- that you're talking about auto regulating your training is that right yeah yep matching the stimulus to your ability on the day that's kevin bass debate for anyone who doesn't know kevin bass says the general population should avoid heavy squats and heavy deadlifts because they're not worth the the risk to reward the risk of injury is not worth the benefit so what are your thoughts on his position on that so the general population? yeah i've mentioned this like before like where you know weightlifting it's like if you want to do it do it you know like the the potential risks are not actually very high um and i think in general like should be encouraged encouraging people to do more of that like since people are already have a, like a, a bias away from that and i've mentioned this um it was like recreational running has a significantly higher injury rate but like how many people are telling people not to run or like ride their bike or or things like that like you don't see that happening um so it's like why are we picking these specific things and, and there's also probably greater drawbacks to not performing like heavier resistant exercise just in general on like your bone density um it has a lot of benefits for your blood pressure pressure, um, cartilage health, and like just the general resiliency and robustness of somebody's body. Like you don't need to do them. Yeah. But um, should you do them? Probably. Um, yeah. And there's, there's a lot of things that are not very safe that we do on a regular basis. Like we drive cars. Um, I mean, one of the things we've been talking about recently to kind of point out how ridiculous
complicit is is like um, a couple of the guys have been getting into like the research on injuries during like sexual intercourse. Oh, that yeah, I saw that post. That's actually hilarious. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's like there are a significant number of injuries, but if you just went around and told everybody, well, you have to be celibate for the rest of your life because of the risk to reward ratio. Yeah. And I actually, now that you mentioned that, uh, like people slipping in like the shower, for example, just like yeah. uh, injuries in the shower, or is it like there's like there's so many benign things like that that people get injured in just in their daily life, and it's like yeah. and they're not even trying to like get a, a particular benefit. And it's like at least if you got injured trying to weightlift, you'd be like trying to get like stronger. It'd be for a reason. Yeah. And the it's interesting because I list I like I was saying like history, and so uh, this YouTuber I follow, and I'm gonna hate myself for I don't remember his name. It's Max something, but he, his um his channel is called like Tasting History, and so he goes over like he's like this is a recipe from this time period, and then like goes over the recipe, and then in the middle while it's cooking he like gives you the history behind it and then like so he did like ribs and he's like oh i'm gonna do like where did table manners come from and he was saying like the number of people that used to die from like choking while eating before the heimlich maneuver came is like a reason why one of the things that are like table manners came up because it was a way to get people to not eat in a way that would potentially increase their risk of choking um because it was such a it was such a huge like problem that like lots of people would be like partying or doing stuff and then they'd like choke on something and die and they there was no way for them to like well somebody was like oh we can just you know if we press real hard here it'll make them spit out that food yeah over time we just learn more effective ways to to act that kind of reminds me of the point of like the source of information you get from so it's like you get credible source of information then you have like reliable approaches uh on how to like you know we're talking about exercise how to exercise more effectively yeah. whereas there's a lot of misinformation out there so you just have to be careful of the sources of information yeah you get and, and generally like i am of the approach like yeah like when people talk about like technique or different things like that i'm like well you know if, if somebody's gonna play basketball like yeah you want it to look like it's basketball but there's lots of different ways you can approach like playing and like styles of play and positions and you know there's all these other things it's like well here's some basketball you just have to know what a basketball is and like in the general rules absolutely yeah it's like uh once you get past a certain level you can get creative with like fundamentals and you can like turn it into your own kind of thing of like you know for example steph curry like shooting from so far out whereas typically people just do like dunks and layups and stuff or whatever yeah exactly um so just another another interesting post you had mm-hmm. um, is exercise is thought to impact fear avoidance behavior. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of getting into like the psychology of exercise. So could you just define like what are fear avoidance behaviors? Um, and then just could you define like pain education? And just, you know, the whole idea and message behind that post. Yeah. So um, I don't remember which one that might have been specifically. The general idea is like f- uh, fear avoidance behaviors would be like, you know, I'm not going to do this or I refuse to do that or um, anticipating that like something could be harmful for, for you to do it like you know like um, I'm not going to bend down because and pick up something or tie my shoes because that hurts my back um, and then becoming fearful of doing that like I don't want to do that because it hurts or uh, some people might have been told like it has a specific effect on like the disc in their back or something like that so um, typically what we see is that with pain education so pain education would be like the education on like it's it's a way of explaining how pain works just like you would explain to somebody like the anatomy of something or like you know this is the color blue like this that's what it is um and how our body goes about um this process of you know you having pain um because there is still even misinterpretations at the highest level of science um where i've seen papers recently that have said like uh, pain like they say oh well like say i stretch my finger back it would say like when i stretch my finger back far enough where it hurts my body sending pain signals to my brain but like that's not how it works it's a contextual thing like it needs a context it needs some other inputs it's a decision uh, by your body to say hey i need to do this to protect you um for some from for some reason and so with the education and the thing is the education has to be coupled with movement because it, it was when this first came around as being like a movement of like educating people on pain like the pendulum swung uh, very far where i think a lot of people were like just like kind of lecturing people about what pain was and like saying like you know this this and this and like sitting them down having session long conversations about it and things like that which i'll do but i don't lecture them it's more of like a conversation like they have questions so i'm answering their questions um but if you're gonna take that approach it has to be very active like you know it'd be like it'd be like me trying to take like i use this quote and i for, always forget who first said it um but it'd be like me trying to take down a brick wall by throwing some like um cooked spaghetti at it like it's not really going to do a whole lot um so unless you pair it with activity you know you can tell somebody something but it's like good storytelling it's like you see this 
like right now, like with Ring to Power and the new Lord of the Rings or um, Game of Thrones show, like there's a lot of in good storytelling showing you things, but not always telling things. So you're like, you can do this or, or this is what's going on. And so then you get people to be like, you know, get that like light bulb, like, oh, now I get it. Because if you just tell them, like, that's where you get into the nerd in me, where you see like the prequel Star Wars movies, like did a lot of, they tell you and give you exposition versus just showing you stuff and then you figuring it out and you go, oh, okay, that makes more sense now. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, narrative is so powerful. That's really an interesting way to coach people. Um, And just in terms of like fear avoidance behaviors, like what are the limitations with that with exercise? So like, could someone be like low on confidence, right? In Mm -hmm. January, let's just say they start the gym in January. And by like June, if they stuck with exercise for six months, like, you know, have like less fear in their overall life, like in and out of the gym, like be more like open to experience and Mm -hmm. like maybe uh, be like physically stronger, like uh, physiologically, but also like psychologically stronger in terms of like how they interact with the world. Yeah, because I think that's something um, and that's something that I post a lot about is like there's a general negativity about the ability of our bodies to adapt um, which I think it's partially like hardwired into us, uh, for survival reasons. Um, but there is something to that. Like you typically find that like the more you stick to it and the more you can see what you can do, then you do develop better self-confidence, self-efficacy. So feeling that you can do something or you're capable of it. Um, and then you see people like, oh, actually like that doesn't make sense why that might hurt me or I would think I would get injured by, while doing that when I can do X, Y, or Z. Yeah, yeah. They kind of reconfigure their like their outlook. So just going back to the point about Kevin Bass's like stance on lifting heavy, what um, should people aim for in terms of like the weight they lift to sort of like maximize the benefits and maybe minimize the side effects? Because like, mm-hmm. as you kind of said already, like the weight you're lifting or like the line of we're not necessarily doing that for health benefits. It's almost just purely like intrinsic enjoyment or motivation that's yeah. going to keep us going. So what are like some good strength goals to aim for uh, to get the majority of the benefits? Yeah. So like if you want a specific goals, there's even like the only I bar, like we were talking about barbell medicine off air, but I remember listening to one of their research uh, roundups. I think it might've been early last year or early this year um, where for like there, there seems to be like some strength benefits or like goals um, that seem to, uh, correlate well with like increase in um, in health markers. One of those is like a leg, you can leg press, it's like 1.9 times your body weight and the ability to bench press uh, 1.1 times your body weight seems to relate well to long-term like health benefits. Um, and just in general, like even for a man uh, being able to have a grip strength of like 60 pounds or for a woman, at least 40 pounds, because below those are markers of like sarcopenia. So like muscle loss, um, those are generally like good ones or like CDC has like um, guidelines for like uh, sit to stand out of a chair, like goals, like where you kind of like should be on average. Um, those are some of them. And then like in general, like if you're in the gym, I would explain like, um, like I use rating perceived exertion, like a zero to 10. And I use this clinically, typically, no matter what rep range I'm in, I'm trying to get somebody between like a six and an eight out of 10 difficulty um, on whatever the exercise we're doing is, uh, because then I know it's like going to be challenging enough to stimulate them like continuously. uh, Because then also the stronger you get, like the only way to increase then the RPE is to make the exercise more challenging in some way. So, okay, you're getting stronger. So instead of like, you know, me rowing a 30 pound weight, feeling like it's an eight, well, now I'm rowing it. It feels like a five or something like that, right? So yeah, kind of figuring out a baseline, like 60% or 80% of your ability and then applying progressive overload to increase that over time so that you're still getting a challenge. Because you don't want to do like, you know, uh, 50 kilos or 50 pounds on the squat in week one, and that's your 60%. And then in week 10, keep doing it. And you're like, this is actually 40% now. So it's like, yeah, you need to uh, adapt the, uh, the the load you're, you're using to get more of a benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th- I think the only like non-smart ways to to lift would be like, it's, it's tough because there's so many different ways that you can achieve the goals and like you still don't see like high injury rates. The exposure to absolute loads and this where they use like um, I've discussed with people who are talking about like envelope of function. So it's either it's, it's having to be a significant amount more of a load than I've ever done before, or just like a ridiculous number of repetitions of something that's really easy. So it would have to be something completely outside of your norm, uh, potentially to cause or be like 
Yep, that's definitely what injured me. Um, and I've seen the only times where I've thought about and then been like, yeah, that probably wasn't really smart for that person was um, so someone I know was like in a contest prep for bodybuilding. So they're already at a low body fat percentage with not a lot of food coming in. Like, it's just not a good situation to be in, like where your body's going to be like, yeah, I'm really primed to be stronger than ever. And then they were doing like daily maxes on um, deadlift, I think it was. And then they end up hurting their back. I was like, well, that kind of makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, you're kind of um, training past your ability there and sort of just almost like ego lifting in a way like as in it's a very rare situation where you need to actually test your max. And if anything, like, you know, moderation, really like a, a moderate approach, but still getting a challenge is going to be the best long term. Yeah, It's just like with anything, right? Like if you're trying to cook popcorn, you, you may not put it in the in the microwave for 10 minutes absolutely yeah i'm thinking of a training question i have do you mind if i fire one at you just yeah go ahead training so i'm into the sixth week of my current training block um and i'm just tapering down my volume so i'm just going to do one squat session um this week because i have the run on saturday i'm going to do squats and i've been doing like you know, um not kind of like 70 percent loads and uh in, in like two to four rep range is kind of what i've been working with and i'm thinking of increasing my the load by roughly 10 five five to ten percent for today's session right uh and i'm going to do that uh for four sets and just go like four by one basically right so it's like it's it's pretty far away from my one rep max but it's still the intensity is pretty high and it's purely just, this is like, I, you know, I've kind of been working up this. Also, the risk is not worth the reward because if I get injured this week of all weeks, I can't run on Saturday. So I'm like really, you know, this motivates me. Uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to this, but also I'm very acutely aware that I do not need to do this. So what are your thoughts on uh, my thinking there? Do you think uh, I'm being unreasonable or do you think it's... No, I, I think that, I mean, that sounds like more of a moderate approach, like a five to 10% jump isn't like a huge amount. And if you've been doing it for fours and you're only going to do it for a single, and that's that sounds more reasonable. And that's almost like a, a similar, you know, like... I might do that as a taper like myself anyway. So it's like still stimulating to maintain strength or even potentially gain strength. Plus you're tapering into a, a competition of like running. Um, so it might actually not feel as bad as if you, because your, your absolute volume accumulation might not be as much. Yeah, that's literally what I'm doing. I'm tapering the volume down and uh, I'm just trying to maintain strength really because- yeah. Cause you're more focused on your running. Yeah, that's my number one goal. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to concurrently train and um, not burn the candle at both ends, but still have a little bit of strength for the, the squatting. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a, that's actually not a bad approach to be taking where you're just doing like, you know, if you're like thinking about gaining strength, like you're being more specific and with not as much volume. And if anything, like that's the thing too, is like with weightlifting, it takes much less to maintain it than it would for like aerobic fitness. If aerobic fitness, like you don't run for two weeks and then you try and go run, like you're going to be fairly gassed, but like with weightlifting, you can, not like lift for two weeks and go in and they still almost do like the same amount of weight yeah it doesn't the uh the detraining effect isn't as strong yeah right yeah and I, and that short approach to training of like six week blocks it was like another guest i had like uh so dr pack is what he goes by because his, his name is greek and it's particularly long but yeah the the shorter blocks are what i'm using so i guess it's not as it's not a wild approach at all yeah. uh, so then just the final question i have is is one of your posts is kind of funny it's uh so i'm active at work uh, and that counts as exercise and then your post was uh well yes but actually no so the physical activity paradox and how your activity at work might not count towards physical exercise can you talk a little bit about that because i would have been of the opinion that like all movement can be exercise. Mm, yeah so the research because this was interesting i when i first was like looking at this research because it was unique to me and, and that's why even i want to do the post wanted to do the post so i could learn about it too um and what i was finding when i got into it was that it, it found finds that you know like 50 percent of people that have physical jobs work outside so they're in environments that are not well regulated they don't have the ability to take breaks when they want to they don't have the ability to like maybe hydrate uh, frequently um and what they found in the studies that they have been looking at this is that um because of that and the uncontrollability of that of environment and stressors and stuff like that for some reason this creates like some sort of like chronic like inflammation and either and, it, and it's kind of like that burning the candle at both ends aspect because it's like they may work long hours doing very physically demanding things without ability to take breaks like we would with regimented exercise um then 
seems to increase their baseline levels of inflammation and increases their blood pressure, um, which then, because they're doing this on multiple days in a row, it doesn't allow that to then come back down, um, which would normally be your recovery, right? So those things happen while we exercise, but then it comes back down, we recover, we go back to it, and then it, you know, starts a process all over again. You're not getting the same aspects of recovery. Um, so it's creating this like, chronic state of like inflammation and, and increased blood pressure, which then over time leads to worse like heart health and, and things like that. That's interesting you, you say that because it makes me think of, so during the pandemic, the gyms shut down. So then mm-hmm. I had to, you know, just quickly grab whatever work I could. So I was doing furniture moving. And it's funny, everybody who I talked to would be like, oh, you must have been so fit. You know, you must have been moving all the time. I'm like, I was. That kind of chronic inflammation was very real. So like you might work like, you know, three to six days in a row and like be working way too hard. Like in terms of like physical exertion, there's like no breaks, like water. And it's really like a tough physical job. And yeah. um, it's, it's exercise, but it's not structured exercise. It's really random. So it's so easy to do too much. And like, you might actually do too much and have to like go again in the next hour, the next day and just, yeah. So um, yeah. your job does not count as as exercise, even though it is movement. It's interesting because we see this in, like in some of the studies they've accounted for like the negative health habits that people in these groups or, you know, socioeconomic status and stuff like that, that they might have. Because um, there's also a white collar paradox where like they don't, move enough anyways and like that's where structured that's where we're seeing like the issues of obesity but then like you see like hunter gatherer tribes um like i forget the name of the main main tribe that like herman poncer studies them he's the evolutionary um anthropologist and he, he talks about metabolism like they're constantly moving and stuff but like i wonder if it's because they have like a goal and they they do have those times where they will rest and it's like this is part of their survival if it has like a different physiological effect for them too um than it does for when it's like created because of this this work that we don't necessarily want to be doing also yeah it's all about how you do it really yeah so if you can get rest when you need it then you'll be able to recover and you know come back again the next day and and do whatever you need to do Um, yeah there's some of these things i'm just speculating on based on like what i have read um but wouldn't say that like i i have the definitive answer absolutely like uh we do need to have structure to our exercise programs otherwise we run the risk of doing too much or not doing enough at all and missing the benefit yeah jacob thanks very much for your time this has been brilliant is Mm -hmm. there any final message or points you want to go over anything you want to plug um i plug my instagram so strength and evidence underscore physio um and then obviously i'm in uh, coaching now myself so um i'm taking on primarily like more powerlifting based people i also take down population or people that are past, you know if you're struggling someone struggling with injury or something um i have all the links on my instagram bio but that's great